everyone and welcome to the show. This is episode number 22 of Pop Culturally Deprived and today we're going to be talking about Schindler's List. I'm Mandy Kay. And I'm Matthew Vose. Today we're joined by our friend Julie Schwartz. Julie is a friend and fellow fan of story and podcast. She's also a writer. She just finished the first draft of her first novel and you guys I'm really excited to read it. Mm. And Julie welcome to the show. I'm so happy you're here with us today. Hi, Mandy. Hi, Matthew. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes, as you said, I just finished the first draft of the first novel I've ever written, so it's very exciting, and I'm looking forward to getting into the revision process. It is a novel about, it's basically a coming-of-age novel uh, about a young girl and her friend, who is a boy, and they're growing up in Arizona in the 1980s, and it's probably for a YA audience. So looking forward to uh, having that see the light of day at some point. So thanks again for having me. I, I appreciate being here and being able to talk to, about this important movie and subject. Absolutely. And we wanted to address the nature of the conversation that we're going to have at the very start of the episode. This film is about a terrible period. There are genuine atrocities that occurred. There is a conversation to be had about what is depicted in the film. And there's a conversation to be had about the movie itself in in how it portrays them and how it is, how it comes across as a piece of media content. We want to make sure those two conversations are treated appropriately. And if we do talk and say something about enjoying a performance, elements that uh, we thought were very good in, in the film itself and in the way it was made, it's in no way reflective of views of what is actually depicted. Julie joining us for this conversation will make it immeasurably deeper. Mandy and I can discuss the movie, we can discuss our feelings on it and the importance of telling this story. Having someone for whom it resonates to them and their their family and their community uh, will help us place it in proper context and discuss the worth of, as said, an important film like this. Yes, well, <laughs> I hope I can do that uh, justice, at least from from my own personal perspective. So thanks again for having me here. No, we're, we're really pleased, and as we say, it is uh, very much worth a, a good conversation about, and um, we'll get into to Mandy's feelings on it in a little bit. So to start off the conversation, uh, Mandy, can you tell us why you haven't seen this film before? So this is the part where I admit that I am just not the brightest crayon in the box, you guys. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) That's a bit harsh. (laughs) Well, you know, but it's not. It's it's not harsh at all. I mean, this movie came out in 1993, and in my immeasurable wisdom of being an 11-year-old, I saw that this movie was in black and white when people started talking about it, and so immediately assumed that this movie was made like back in the 30s. <laughs> Therefore, it was old, and I had no interest in watching it. And it was about the Holocaust, so it was probably a documentary, black and white, just, yeah, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. Yeah, not the brightest crayon in the box, you guys. Well, if it makes you feel any better, not counting this movie for a very long time, at least through the end of high school, I had the same bias against anything that was old or black and white <laughs> or documentary, probably. So yeah. <laughs> you're not alone. Yeah, it's, it's, I was so misguided in my youth. It's <laughs> shameful. Shameful. The point is you're here now. <laughs> um, although I'd seen this uh, in my teenage years, um, I think as as a school thing, I've always conflated it with something more educational than perhaps it is intending to be, uh, because I can remember it being used at school by history teachers when when teaching this period. So that's wow. where it's always sort of sat, sat in my head, rather than it being no, this is a, a film for everyone to take in. It's a this is a thing to teach young generations. That okay. is interesting. They showed this in your school. Yes. Um, I had had a good conversation with my dad about this because he was head of the school uh-huh. and and a history teacher. Uh, he said there were, there were different ways that people used it. For him, he was always sort of picking certain elements because there is some in the depiction that is actually very useful to show. Uh, and particularly being a story about someone working against the Nazis or working to save the Jewish people. There aren't huge numbers of stories about that from that time. But there were also teachers who would go, hey, it's a three-hour film. That's going to take up a good number of lessons. <laughs> Let's put this on. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's, um, I can't imagine that happening in the U.S. <laughs> Certainly not uh, back even in the 90s. Yeah, no, when our teachers wanted to do that, we watched Forrest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we watched Star Wars. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I don't think they were putting this on just for fun, or just as a, we're doing a movie day. This was, we're teaching history, but I can get through three lessons at least with. Right. Yeah, uh, that's this on. Yeah. interesting. Very interesting, yeah. My dad, he said that the children treated it slightly differently when they watched this, because they knew it was a film. It was actors that they'd seen, you know, oh, it's that guy from Star Wars, or, hey, look, it's Gandhi. And obviously now <laughs> they're probably, oh, hey, it's Voldemort. <laughs> But whereas if you put on a, a genuine documentary from the time that was still black and white and had some of the same look and feel, they would treat it differently and take something a bit different out of it as they watched. Yeah, okay. that makes sense. Mm. Too. Quite interesting. I, I expected, when, when I asked the question, I thought his answer was going to be, oh, it was so useful, it just put everything in such a, a more concise way and it was such a, a great way into teaching the Holocaust. But no, actually, some of the genuine documents from the time and some of the things made after uh, seems to have been more useful. Mm. Yeah. Well, before we get started, I do want to give a little bit of a note of something that's a little different for this episode. Usually, uh, when our new episodes air, we share a link to a Google Doc where I have documented my thoughts of the movie, kind of in the style of a live tweet. There is no such document for this movie. I did start writing down my thoughts, but live tweeting that way kind of lends itself to an air of sarcasm or snark. And so I found that I really wasn't giving the material the proper gravitas that it required. I mean, when Ray Fiennes appeared on the screen, I wrote Nazi Voldemort down, and I realized that's probably not the best use of my time. So I decided to stop documenting and experience the film the way it was intended. I think that was the right choice to do, because it is a film you have to focus on. There's, there's a lot going on and to take out of all the performances and all the inferences. Yeah, it's an interesting interesting thing to me that my mindset does go into this frame of like cynicism and snark when I'm doing it and it makes me wonder how many of the movies that we've watched have been impacted because I'm doing that Mm -hmm. just I'll have to give that some thought before the next one yeah that's very interesting I mean I think with this one in particular just because it's so well done every bit of it from you know, the cinematography to the music, to the sound, to the way everything sort of comes together, along with the obvious, the acting and the writing. If you're taken away from it at all, which I was the first time I rewatched it here in March, uh, first time I'd rewatched it in a long time, I think it does take away some of the overall impact of what Spielberg was trying to do. So I think that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I can understand why you did that. Mm. Schindler's List is a 1993 film directed by Steven Spielberg and written by Steven Zalian. The movie is based on the 1982 novel Schindler's Ark by Australian novelist Thomas Keneally. It is a fictionalized account of a period in the life of German businessman Oskar Schindler during which he saved the lives of more than a thousand mostly Polish Jews during the Holocaust. When Steven Spielberg read the New York Times review of the novel, his interest in the story was enough for Universal Pictures to buy the rights. According to a biography of Spielberg, in 1983, when he met with one of the survivors on Schindler's List and the inspiration for Keneally's novel, Poldek Pfefferberg, Spielberg told him he would start filming in 10 years. Filming began in Krakow, Poland on March 1, 1993. They shot as much of the film as possible at or near the actual locations, though they had to reconstruct the Płaszów camp nearby because you can see modern high-rise apartments from the original location. Exterior shots of Schindler's factory were actually filmed at the factory. There were times where the German and Polish languages were spoken in the film in an effort to recreate the feeling of being present in the past. Spielberg considered subtitling the whole movie and keeping it in German and Polish, but he decided that there's too much safety in reading. It would have been an excuse to take their eyes off the screen and watch something else. Schindler's List was shot in the style of a documentary with no storyboards. 40% of the film was shot with handheld cameras and used no steady cams, elevated shots, or zoom lenses. It was in black and white to match the feel of actual documentary footage of the era, though there were small amounts of color used for emphasis. The film premiered on November 30, 1993 in Washington, D.C., before being widely released in the U.S. on December 15. It was a box office success, earning more than $320 million worldwide with a budget of only $22 million. Part of the reason that budget was so low was because Spielberg refused to accept a salary for the movie. He considered it blood money if he had. Schindler's List was nominated for 12 Academy Awards, and it won seven, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Adapted Screenplay, and Best Original Score. Both Liam Neeson and Rafe Fiennes were nominated for Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor, respectively, but neither won. 
and the Library of Congress selected it for preservation in the National Film Registry in 2004. And we do like to tell everybody how we watch the movies that we're talking about in case you guys would like to go watch as well. Uh, it was available on Netflix in the U.S. I think it just recently became available, so I don't know how long it will still be there. But if you do want to watch and you're in the U.S. and you have Netflix, you can watch it. In the U.K., it was aired a little while ago on Channel 5 without adverts. I'd forgotten how long the film was when I saw it was three and a bit hours I thought oh okay, I'll fast forward to the adverts but no that was the length of the film <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes. yeah I actually watched it back in March when it was available on stars on demand but it was only available till the end of that month and then I felt that I should just give it one more rewatch right before this and Mandy told me it was on Netflix I think it was probably recently just put on Netflix because it wasn't back in March because of the Holocaust Remembrance Day that just happened in April. So mm. I don't know how much longer they'll keep it up. So Mandy, when you uh, came in to watch this, what were your expectations for this film? I had a few expectations and most of them were not accurate, it seems. I did, of course, expect it to be sad. It's a movie about the Holocaust. It can't not be sad. I did expect to feel some anger um, and some kind of righteous indignation, and I did. But I expected it to be about a very righteous man, a man who, from the beginning, was about saving people. Mm. And that's, that's what I expected. I expected it to be someone who I could relate to, and I was very shocked when that's not what this movie was really about. Mm. Yeah, that, that opening scene really brings that home. You don't often see many scenes of your protagonist schmoozing the Nazi party. Well, honestly, I I assumed probably for the a good 15 or 20 minutes that he was doing it on purpose because him doing that was somehow helping the Jews. I didn't realize that he was just being a businessman who's trying to, you know, con all these people. Mm. Just greasing the I, wheels. I didn't, yeah, mm. I totally thought, oh... You know, he's doing this on purpose for a good reason and not just because he wanted a lot of money. Mm, yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting. I think it's a great opening scene. This mm -hmm. man can work a room was what I thought when I rewatched it now. In the book, which I read back in high school after I saw the movie for the first time and then reread it again now in preparation for this podcast. In the book, they give you some more background on Schindler. This is a man who likes attention and does everything big and wants to be not just rich, but, you know, fabulously wealthy and successful. And in the book, you get a sense of part of why he wants that so much. I mean, obvious reasons, right? Who doesn't want to be wealthy? But his father was a philanderer. And I think that at least, you know, according to the book, he really never got over that. What, how his father, <laughs> ironic, right? As you get yeah. through it. Mm -hmm. He never really got over how his father left his mother for some other woman and left them. And I think he just wanted to one-up his father, at least the way it's described in the book, and be more successful at a greater level than his father. And that was certainly a motivator. Interesting. But again, it wasn't that he was, you know, this yeah. humanitarian who was trying to save people. Not at that point. I think we'll talk about it later. But yeah, I'm, I'm actually quite pleased that didn't make it in, in that level of backstory. Mm -hmm. Mandy, what are your experience of other World War II films or films depicting some of these events? Surprising no one. I don't have much experience with it. Okay. I have seen, I guess, sort of in the same vein, movies that kind of depict what happened in the concentration camps and that sort of thing. I have seen The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, and I've seen Life is Beautiful. World War II in general, I've seen, you know, Pearl Harbor, and I've seen Saving Private Ryan, but both of those are very much from an American point of view, and so you mm -hmm. don't really see what was happening in Europe in those kind of movies. Other than that, I really don't think I've seen very much because I, um, yeah, they were action guy movies and I don't care about war movies, <laughs> or at least I didn't, you know, so there was no reason for me to watch war movies. Yeah, quite hard to make a film in this time and not make it a war movie. <laughs> right, mm. right. <laughs> so it's a question I always ask, and it's an unusual one to ask in this situation, but did you enjoy Schindler's List? I don't even know how to answer that question. Mm. What no. did you take away from it? <laughs> I, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't dislike it. 
I, I think it's a very important movie, and I think that it's a beautiful movie. I think mm. it depicts a very terrible time in human history, and it, it does so in a way that tries to make you invested in the movie and bring you along on that emotional journey. And I think, I think that it did what it set out to do. That being said, I'm not going to sit down and watch this movie for fun. Right. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think fun is not one that you attribute to this. And very much as you go through, you can see he's not making this as a piece of entertainment. Right. Mm. Like, like we talked about in the production section, it took him 10 years to be okay with making this movie. Mm. And he struggled a lot while making the movie. I read in several places where he cried almost daily while making this movie. And he had Robin Williams calling him to be funny on the phone at night to give him a break so that he could, you know, get through to the next day. Mm. And I, I can't imagine participating in this movie at all. I can't imagine being one of the actors in it. I can't imagine directing it. I can't imagine just being on the set watching it. It's just, it's hard, but I think it's important. And so I'm glad that these people were strong enough to do something that I don't think I would have been able to. Well said. I mean, I think also having filmed this in Poland, I have spoken to people who've gone to Poland to see some of the concentration camps and, and get that experience. And apparently it is, it's very difficult. It's, it's devastating, you know? So I, I can't imagine being immersed in this where you are, I mean, as an actor, right, playing, playing this role, you are, you, you become these people, you, you are living this life for the amount of time it took to film it. Just for me, just preparing for this podcast has been rough. I've been down <laughs> for the last, <laughs> well, as long as, especially the last few days, you know, as I, I got further immersed in it. So yes, it's, it's very difficult, but it's important, you know, and I think that he did my opinion, I don't know if this is the time to say it, but I just think that, I think it was absolutely successful in what he was attempting to do. I think he achieved it, mm. uh, Spielberg, you know. I'll absolutely agree because it's a story that I didn't know. I don't think it was a, a, a well-known story. So going into it, you don't know what's going to happen and it does engross you. It, it absolutely captures you and, and depicts exactly what it sets out to do you, you don't feel they pull any punches at you um, and it really comes across everything that he wanted people to portray everything you want he wanted people to experience from, from taking in this film right mandy are you pleased you've now seen it pleased i've yeah seen again it. not the right word but <laughs> i mean i think i am better for it from a human perspective mm -hmm. because it's just a reminder of how awful humans can be and how as a fellow human, I need to do better and I need to to speak up if I see something happening like that, if I see people being mistreated. You know, even even if it's nothing on the level of, of what happened in Poland and, and Germany during this time, as a human, when you allow injustices to happen, small injustices to happen, it can escalate into what happened in our history. And so it's a, just a reminder of what huma humans are capable of and that we don't want to do that again. That's exactly why this movie was a success. The, I mean, you have encapsulated it because as we always say, and I'm, other people I'm sure say this too, of course, but remembering the Holocaust for Jewish people is obviously something that is something that is is stressed and so less less we forget we are doomed mm. to repeat the errors of the past so having these reminders however difficult they are is very important because you see these kinds of things happening throughout history in other places i mean syria and other places where there are genocides it's, it's devastating and and you look at that and it's it's practically the same it's the same kind of thing happening all over again, you know, so. Yeah. Um, b before we go kind of more deep into the rabbit hole of the meat of the movie, I do want to just remind everybody that while Oscar Schindler was a real person and there was a list that came out of, you know, the employees in his factory and, and those, those folks were saved, this is still a fictionalized account of that period of time. It's an accurate portrayal, I think, when you look at it from an emotional perspective and when you look at individual incidents, I mean, the portrayal of Eamon Gert is actually not even as strong as it needed to be 
but it was enough that when survivors saw Ray Fiennes in his in, in his costume and character, they trembled and they were so terrified because of how accurate his depiction was. And so it was fictionalized. A lot of the stuff did not happen the way it was portrayed on screen. Oscar Schindler was not quite the hero that he was portrayed to be. But overall, I think they did a good job of putting it all together and giving us a good picture of what things were like, if that makes sense. Absolutely. In reading the book, it it holds very close to the book but as as you discovered and and pointed out there this book is from 1982 there is a later one I guess in 2004 that sort of says uh, some of this stuff didn't quite happen you know exactly in this uh, dramatized way that it is spelled out to be so uh, right. but this is a story it's it's told in the form of a novel and then a movie so it's not a documentary but Basic facts are there. I, they are true. The, the story did come from uh, one of the survivors who was on Schindler's List. His name was Poldek Pfefferberg. And he had been trying, he lived in Beverly Hills. He worked on Rodeo Drive. He had a luggage and leather shop. And he had been trying since the 60s to get somebody in Hollywood to listen to the story and to tell the story of Oscar Schindler. And finally, he met Thomas Keneally, who was a novelist, and he told the story, and that's that's how Thomas Keneally wrote the book. He heard the story, and then he wrote his own version of it, I guess, and did a, I mean, he did a lot of research yeah. about what was going on in that particular camp and everything, but when, when he, he wrote it, he did take a lot of liberties. But an interesting thing, so um, Poldek Pfefferberg was actually going by the name Leopold Page at the time, and Leopold Page was a consultant on the movie. And so he was there. I mean, a survivor, like an actual survivor who was on that list, who was portrayed in the movie, was there on the set. And and so I, I can't really fault the movie for anything that they did. I just want to make sure that, that folks don't go into it thinking that this is a documentary. Right. Like I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and there were, it says there were interviews of, of, of about 50 survivors and also Emily, if I'm pronouncing it right, Schindler, um, Oscar Schindler's wife, and some of the few business people, not maybe not Nazis, I don't know, um, who survived. It, it's mentioned that, that there were interviews of, of those people as well. I, I think that it's important to know that, the, yeah, the, the majority of it and a lot of the anecdotes and, and the way it's told in the book is one person described that this is how it happened and others say this is how it happened. All we know is right. somebody okay. did X, yeah. you know. So you know that something generally happened, for example, but exactly how it went down or maybe what the dialogue surrounding it, etc., or the timing, you know, that's that's going to change as, as any good story teller might might do it yeah and I think at the end of the day it's important to remember that even you know there's a biography of Oscar Schindler that came out in like 2004 or something um, by a man whose last name was Crow I can't remember his first name and he said basically Schindler himself had very little to do with the list you know he may have added you know four or five names but he didn't know any of these people which is a very different sense than what you get when you read the book or watch the movie But I think regardless of that, these people would not have been saved if it were not for Oscar Schindler and his factor. Right. Hmm. And so I think by romanticizing it and fictionalizing it a little more helps the audience relate to Oscar Schindler as a human and kind of relate to the whole situation a little more, which gives it an air of authenticity and makes it the important story that it needed to be. Exactly. Just working at his factory saved lives, right? He right. did what he had to do to get all of these people extra food. And that was life. You know, the book said they were getting up to, I forget, 1,200, 2,000 calories a day. Others in other camps, not necessarily concentration camps, but factories, 600 calories a day. And you, you sort of yeah. see the level of work that they're doing. Even if you're sitting around mm-hmm. doing nothing, 600 cal- calories is not going to be enough. I think the end product was, you can't say he wasn't a hero in the end for the result. He was absolutely flawed, though. (laughs) There's no question. That's what makes him so interesting. Um, 
Yeah. I think the word you used a bit earlier, Julie, dramatised, is actually quite important. There are bits here that have some of that dramatic licence because it is still a piece of media content. And it started off with that like oral tradition, oral history, and then stories becoming a book that then became a film. Yes. So it is going to change slightly. But there's nothing in here that I would say, when we've talked about other films, we talk about, oh, no, that didn't make sense. I didn't understand the motivation or the physics or, or something of a moment. Mm-hmm. There's nothing in this I go, oh, hang on. I, no, I don't believe that would... In fact, the only bit that did as I was watching it is um, the fact that the factory, when they started making shells, never put out any shells that were usable. He didn't want people making something that would actually aid to the war effort. And I went, well, that's that's a lot of risk to take. That's actually quite dangerous. And, and I don't think anyone would have... Not objected is the wrong word, but it was keeping them safe by being able to work there. So you have to produce something in the end. But you go back and read, and yeah, absolutely, they did buy black market shells to pass off as their own. Yeah, they um, absolutely did, yeah. So there is definitely a point. You can say he, he took a moral stance and did something. For everything else about wanting the factory, wanting to raise money, and seeing opportunity for himself, there is definitely a point where you go, okay, he's actually done something here that, that was quite significant, that, that showed something of his character. Yes, and had he not been so selfish earlier on, he wouldn't have had as much money to start burning through toward the end. Yeah. So. Mm. Yeah. so for me, uh, one of the interesting bits um, the, for the conversation is the impact on different people. Um, obviously, we've talked a bit about Mandy, and I've, I've said I had a, an interesting conversation with my father as the impact for teaching of history. Julie, you said this was quite hard to watch even so many years later. What did the film mean to you and your family and, and the wider community when it was released and as people see it? Wow, yes, that is... That is an excellent question. Believe it or not, nobody has ever asked me something like that before. Okay. So as Sorry? I, as I said, I did <laughs> see it um, in high school when it came out, hmm. and as I recall, I think I may have only seen it once, and then within about a year after that, I I read the book and was really okay. surprised to see how how close they held to each other. It was just so sad. It's sad um, for anybody who watches it, I, I would think, um, you know, if you're, if you're human. <laughs> yes. But growing up Jewish, you know, in, this is something that's, that's, you know, talked about a lot, obviously. In my Hebrew school in eighth grade, the whole year covered only two topics. Half of it was the Holocaust and half of it was comparative religion. So, you know, this is something that's really covered in detail. And it's so devastating to go through it with whatever art form it is that's portraying it, whether it's a book or, or a movie, mm. that I just didn't feel I could watch it again, frankly. And, and so I didn't until March of this year, you know, tw- 24 years later. Okay. I guess part of it is is that it's just a little more real. I don't know if it's if it's more real for people who are Jewish than people who are not. I guess I can only speak from my own mm-hmm. perspective. I think that everybody has a story, some story in their family that, that relates to this. And I, I spoke to my mom about this because I do remember okay. her telling us about her mother's cousins. And so my that's my grandma, my grandma Rosie. They, you know, they lived in New York. And my grandmother's cousin, one of them, was visiting from Austria. Her family is from Austria. Okay. And she said that she had been hearing that things were, terrible things were happening back home. And she said, I, I can't stay. I have to go back. I have to go be with my family. And so she left. She left America and she went back to Austria and she and all of the rest of the cousins were all killed in concentration camps. Oh. Oh. And I didn't know any of them, obviously, but this is devastating for me to hear. And, and, and my, what my mom said was, you know, she thinks of that. And she thinks, if you'll pardon bringing in just a tad of religion here, she says thinks that she thinks, um, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. Because it could have been her. Uh, if they hadn't come to America, if her grandparents hadn't come to America. Um, my mom was born in 1942. She would have been born right during the war. And they didn't save any babies. Uh, You saw the scene in the movie with the children going off in those trucks. I think that's one of the parts that hit me the hardest, especially having kids. Kids were of no use and could not work, so they didn't get a chance to sort of make it through the war. (laughs) I think that the thought of 
all of those all of those people all of those relatives that could have been what they could have become maybe somebody would have been a rocket scientist who knows mm. so i think it's hard not to think of it that way it becomes more personal and that's just you know that's just from our our perspective in the larger jewish community i you know i can't obviously i can't speak for <laughs> anybody yeah. you know for other people let alone the, the whole community but i think it's very individualized for everybody i have known at least two friends who's who each had a grandmother actually who survived the concentration camps um Mm -hmm. both of them have the tattoo you know and they have their stories and so it affects them differently but it's just it's something that's you know it's in the collective history and consciousness of of this whole i guess people and it's not something you think about all the time. I mean, I grew up, you know, on the West Coast, and uh, it's just, uh, yeah. you know, my dad was always a little more, I always thought he was just over the top with some things, you know, he would say, oh, how can these people drive Mercedes, a German car? And I'm like, you know, dad, come on. <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. not everybody's a Nazi. You know, of course, he, he would say that Daimler Benz and Daimler, I guess, was involved in the uh, making of the canisters for the gas chambers. You know, so I think everybody sees it in their own sort of way. Mm-hmm. So, you know, growing up when I was younger, I just thought, oh, you know, you know how you, you, you see your parents. They just ridiculous they are over the top so it's not something that that comes up all the time but then when you see Mm -hmm. a movie like this or when you go to one of the holocaust museums it just becomes more real and it's it's something you 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 know you think about really interesting and thank you i know it's a very personal subject (laughs) and as you say it does impact everyone of whatever faith you would hope. Yes. It, it is a very impactful film. Exactly. And that's why when you, not to get too political, but when you hear things about lists of groups of people, perhaps for some other mm-hmm. religion, like lists of Muslims, God, the red flags go up and it's like, hey, we've been here before. This is not okay. Yeah. I, I hope that it makes people, as Mandy said earlier, pay attention to things like this that could lead to, I mean, the Holocaust didn't happen in one day, you know? These, mm-hmm. these kinds of things took a very long time and just escalated and escalated. So, And it, it is very good at showing the, the escalation, but for, for Schindler and for Stern. Yes. They weren't trying to save 1,100, 2,000, you know, everyone that they could at once. It was the guy with no arm, let's, let's get him a job. The guy who's been rejected, who's a bit old, let's get him a job. This girl's parents, let's, let's bribe someone to get her, them in. Eventually, you have the moment of creating the lists, which is the the big moment of spending the fortune to save as many people as possible. But it, it snowballs from small acts of kindness. Yes, yeah. The, like I said, I think the movie does does an excellent job and kind of if you don't have as much experience knowing the background of what happened leading up to and during the Holocaust, this is a success in in showing that. So can I? jump in again mm-hmm. and just be the Debbie oh I don't want to say that I was going to say I'm going to be the Debbie Downer but that that's not a good oh thing my God. to say I in this I'm conversation like the, downer in this thing. <laughs> the movie was a critical success you know mm-hmm. and we keep talking about that how it did what it set out to do it was critically acclaimed you know it, it won Academy Awards but not everybody did love the movie most of the criticism did come from scholars not the critics. And I just wanted to point out a couple of them because cause when you see what they had to say, it makes a valid point and it makes me reconsider some of the things that I quote unquote enjoyed about the movie. So author Sarah Horowitz noted that the focus on Gert as villain ignored the role that ordinary Germans and Poles played in the Holocaust. Hmm. Brown University history professor Omer Bartov noted that the Jewish actors all seemed small and furtive compared to the large and imposing Neeson and Fines, and that they seemed like spectators to their own story instead of protagonists. Hmm. And then Claude Landsman, who was the filmmaker for the documentary Shoah, which is the essentially the definitive Holocaust documentary, he criticized Spielberg for presenting the story from the point of view of a German protagonist. This is not 
Spielberg never set out to tell the definitive story of the Holocaust. He never said he was making the Shoah. Mm. He's telling the story of Oscar Schindler, and he is also, not just Schindler, but Schindler and his impact during the Holocaust in saving a thousand or more Jewish people at great risk, ultimately, to himself and his family. People who were caught even doing the smallest acts were themselves sent to concentration camps or shot, taken by the Gestapo and never to be seen again. So I understand that. I understand the criticism, certainly. It's a three-hour film. You can only do so much. I think with the last criticism, oh, how could you tell it from the perspective of a German or, or you know, somebody who's not Jewish, but that's the story he's telling. Mm. So there's there's mm. other ways of telling other stories. There's a million, There's there's six million other stories out there. This is one. That's that's my perspective right. on it. I think the comment about showing the Jews as small and furtive is an interesting word choice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about furtive. Schindler had to be as you know larger than life because that is the character he was, and that's how he's certainly described. And actually, the book has very grainy, faded pictures. God, they look just like them. The the actors for uh, Ray Fiennes and, and Liam Neeson look just like the pictures. It's just really interesting. Yes, they are shown as meek. I think that's fair. Could they have shown them differently? For much of it, these people are prisoners. And even though Schindler's not going to, you know, he, he's not a typical Nazi, you know, at any moment, I think they know that things could turn. So I think that was all accurate. But, you know, had he wanted to add more time to this three hour movie, or maybe cut something, I'm not sure what, he could have shown at the end how, which what's described in the book, uh, Schindler had gathered up a huge arsenal by the time the war ended and he left. Mm -hmm. And he left those arms with the, you know, the, the people in the camp, uh, you know, in the, in the factory. And mm -hmm. they had been training to use them all along. And there's one boy, I think he's a boy, maybe he's, he's a teenager or in 20s, it's hard to tell from the book, who, you know, was in, in favor with not just Schindler, but also Emily Schindler. And hey, here you go. And they, he, he was the one who started, you know, practicing with these weapons and then teaching others. So when Schindler and his wife left and you had all of these remaining Jews in the factory just waiting to be liberated in the book it's described how they're armed and when some truck drives by they're ready to do whatever is necessary to defend themselves that was left out I don't know how, how do you guys feel about the fact that 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 type of um, perspective was was left out which does change sort of the overall view of how this whole group of people looks I think it was a good decision, honestly, because the emotions, that point, and, and I was going to talk about that scene actually later because that's my favorite scene, is, is how Oscar is relating and reacting to the people that he's leaving behind. And I think if they had been armed, it wouldn't have been the same conversation. It wouldn't have been as highly emotional as it was. And so... I wouldn't have been left feeling the way that I was. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what the right word is for how I was feeling. I mean, of course, I was sobbing like a baby at this point, <laughs> yes. you know, and, and, and partly it was because I was reacting to Oscar's emotional breakdown of him, you know, looking at his car and saying, mm -hmm. if I hadn't kept this car, I could have saved, you know, 40 more people. If I hadn't kept these cufflinks, that's two more people, you know, and, and like I was... I was gone at that point. I was completely sobbing. And the reaction of the people to him was very loving. It was very generous. It was very accepting of him. And that's where we got that line, you know, you save one life, you've saved the entire world. The impact of that conversation and that response from the people in the factory would not have been the same if we had seen them all armed to the teeth the way they actually right. were. I, I think that, and they were, I mean, that that's not just a fictional thing from the book. If, if it was in the book that way, that's true. Right. They, they did, they did have, you know, they, they were prepared um, for whatever may have come next, but I don't think the emotional impact to that scene between the workers and Schindler would have been the same if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I don't know that they were literally physically armed at the moment that he left, but when he left, you know, then they had all of these arms. And, and I think I agree with you. It would have taken away 
from the storytelling of this mm-hmm. to have then cut to, hey, epilogue, they're standing here armed, and, you know, it just would have taken away from that scene going into the next scene, which was, you know, basically the end of the movie. Right. Mm. Well, plus, them not having guns in the movie really kind of brought home the idea that they're free, but what do they do next? You know, like... The lone Russian who comes up on horseback and is like so proud. Hey, you guys are free now, and they're just like, what? What? Like nothing changed for them except all of a sudden they didn't have the threat of death every second. But they have no home. They have no money. They have no food. They have nothing. And the guy who came to liberate them is not prepared. You know, and I, I say liberate very loosely, but the guy who came is not prepared to help them. So again, the emotional impact of the reality of the situation they were finding themselves in would have been lessened if we had seen that they had all of these additional resources. And I do view an arsenal as resources because they could trade the guns. They could do something with the guns to to get things that they need. And and so I just, I think it was the right call for the story that he was telling, like you said. Yes. And you know, I, when I rewatched it, just the end last night, Just to remind myself, you know, I noticed something that I hadn't noticed before, which is in the book. There is a line as Oscar is leaving the factory and heading toward the car, and he's talking to Stern, and he's telling him what to do, and he says something like, and there's fabric. Give two, you know, two yards of fabric to each person and a bottle of vodka. Mm -hmm. They won't drink it, but they can trade it. This was in the book and made a difference for a lot of these people. They were able to, he had been acquiring those textiles for this purpose because he knew, you know, because he was listening to the BBC, you know, on pirate radio or whatever. He knew this this was not going well for the Germans and that the end was coming. And so he had, at least according to this book, gathered this fabric and they were able to sell it. Some of them used it to make warmer clothes because, you know, when they left in the winter. That made a difference and being able to trade vodka That's the other thing. It's sort of, you know, further back in time. All of those baskets that they show, the bribes that he's giving, Mm -hmm. the people who receive the baskets are thinking, wow, you know, this is great. But I mean, these things were nearly impossible to get. This was huge money to put together those baskets with things like fruit, you know, citrus or uh, chocolate and things like that. Coffee even. Yeah. Yeah. I, I liked that scene just because it showed what lengths he was willing to go to get what he wanted. Yeah. I think one of the comments about uh, the people not being protagonists in their own film, but as you say, Julie, the film is not the Jewish people of Schindler's List. It is Schindler's List, and it, it takes a good arc in showing what he did and his impact, and you end with the, the emotional impact on him because he was using the, the bit of power that he had to help people who didn't have power, and it would have changed that dynamic slightly going out into, oh, there's more of this story to tell, but we're not going to tell you unless we want to start adding another half hour, another hour to this film. Right. I'm not sure the studio would have been happy with that. <laughs> yeah. They weren't happy with this movie. You know, mm. it was... <laughs> they let him make it, but... The studio itself was really hesitant to do a three-hour black and white movie. They did not want to do it. You know, I guess they were proven wrong because it turned out to be a very successful movie for them. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yes. Mandy, you said at the beginning that because it was in black and white, you thought, oh, this must be an old film or a documentary. Why do we think that Spielberg went with the decision to make it black and white? Some of it is... Because he, he wanted it to look like it was from the period. He wanted, you know, all of the, the source documentary material from that period was in black and white. Mm. And so he, he was doing that. And I think it gave a way to not beautify it. I think, in fact, that that was one of the things that he said, that when the studio agreed to do it in black and white, they wanted him to at least have color negatives so that if they wanted to in the future, they could make it a color film. And he, Spielberg refused because he said he didn't want anybody to beautify it. Right. And so he was going for that raw, gritty truth of what he was trying to tell and the story that he was trying to tell. Yeah, I think I think I can see that. I think I can agree with that, that yes, it, it makes it look part of the everything else you will see from that time period. So, so you do get more invested in believing it yeah well but then also with it being in black and white and you getting the little bits of color like the little girl in the red coat Mm. 
watching that scene, I think, had she not been wearing the red coat, I still would have been sitting there with my heart in my throat because she was such a carefree little girl walking through the streets during a massacre. Yeah. But with that red, when they made that coat red in the middle of everything else, you literally could not watch anything but her. And so you ended up just so immersed in terror, for lack of a better word, of what's going to happen. I just can't imagine them having done it any other way. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, the girl in the red in the red coat is probably one of the most iconic moments in that film. I, I think that's probably the mm-hmm. one everybody everybody talks about, and mm-hmm. it just makes it as as though it's not all so real. But that is a moment where it's just so real to you. Oh my God, this little girl, you know. And there's one moment as it goes through that sort of struck me. It feels like it would be trying to add drama to something or uh, a misdirect in another film. But but in this, you don't. I don't think he would have done it. And that's when the train of the women is misdirected to Auschwitz, and the women have all their hair cut off, stripped naked, and then pushed into a room that goes pitch black. And there, you can you you get the the sense of the terror of them, the screaming, and on what they think is coming next. But it turns out to be showers. It is. It is part of the process of bringing them into the camp. If I'd been watching something else, I would have gone, "Oh, that's." I'm not sure they should have done that, setting us up to think something even worse is going to happen here. I don't know if I just feel that it's that's as much as they could show of some of the atrocities and trying to give you the sense of the terror without necessarily being able to show it. Is that hmm. is that too far? Is is it a powerful scene? Does it work? For me, this worked just because, hmm. as you say, showing the sheer terror of of not knowing what's what's going to come out of those shower heads because they showed you earlier right the the woman in the in the in the barracks talking about how you know this is what they do they bring you in and they, you know they tell you you're, you're going to be showered, but instead you know they gas you hmm. could they have shown more i mean again. This is sort of a similar point to what one of the critics said. This is not the story of Auschwitz, and you can certainly get that in in a number of other places. I think the whole Auschwitz scene, from the moment they arrive at night, I think there's no music, and the squealing of those cattle cars along the the rails as they stop and then coming out into this this frigid night air and the dogs barking and and again with the tables the tables and the setup um and the and and where are we and what what is happening and you know following that i mean this was probably certainly a dramatic element that was added with the little boy who draws his finger across his um neck as they're Mm -hmm. getting closer to the camp i think the whole the whole experience of then having their hair cut like that and all the the yelling and the screaming i think they did a good job at showing just that whole experience and, and how terrifying it was i don't know how accurate actually as i'm speaking that was because my understanding was that it was all done like it was a hoax you would get there and they would have musicians playing they would have violinists and don't worry you know like Mm. they said label your suitcases they'll follow you later because they didn't want people to panic so i i i get it for this movie and and showing that kind of element because they only had so many minutes to do everything they wanted to do with auschwitz here in this movie um so i i think that that worked you know for the movie overall but I don't know how accurate that was because I think they really, the Nazis were very good at trying to control the situation and they didn't need anybody panicking and, and, and having a, a full-fledged riot on their hands. So I'm not sure it normally went down that way when when um, people arrived. Okay. Yeah, th- that's what I was going to say too, is it, it also worked for me because this is one of the ways in which fictionalizing what happened allows us as the audience to experience the terror and the emotions that we need to experience while watching a movie like this. There was an article in the New York Times written by an actual survivor after, an Auschwitz survivor, after she watched this movie. And she talked about how this, she didn't want to nitpick, but she wanted people to understand that this scene would never have happened in real life because the Nazis worked really hard not to let people know that they were sending people to gas chambers and then burning them. Mm. And so they wouldn't have known to be scared. They would have just thought they were going to, to a shower. And the other flip side of that was in the actual gas chambers there were no there was no water 
like the shower heads weren't ever hooked up to water. And so there's just no way that, that this would have happened exactly the way that it was portrayed in the movie. But I think that's okay because the terror that those women experienced was something that we needed to experience. And so that's why it worked really well for me. I mean, again, I was sobbing. I think I started sobbing during the ghetto massacre with the little girl. And then I'm not sure that I stopped until the movie was done. Yeah. And one interesting point that was in the book, and I think a reason why, you know, I think he did uh, as good of a job as could be done in a movie with the limited time you have, is that in the book, I, I looked at it again, and I don't think it tells you how long they were there. But in the movie, it seems like they're there, you know, maybe a day or two or something. Um, An overnight. Yeah. yeah. No. In the book, it's weeks, if not a month or two. Mm. They, you know, they came down with typhus and dysentery, and one of them was down to 70 pounds, it's described. They were there for a very long time. And I don't think it was a mistake in the strictest sense of the word. The men also stopped at a concentration camp on the way to the new factory, but they were only there overnight, Gross Rosen, and then they went on. So I, I don't know if that was just sort of the way it worked when you're traveling along the rails like this. And that was one of the examples of how the list changed. You had Goldberg. He's the guy who keeps getting the the bribes from Schindler, right? You see the cigarette case. He hands it to Stern. And Stern, then Mm. the the next shot is this guy opening it and and smoking the cigarettes. So he, you know, he's an interesting character because he's Jewish. But he's taking the advantage that he can, right? To, Mm. To survive, to look out for number one, I guess, really. He was on the train with the men. He put his own name on the list. Of course, he had a lot of control over the list, according to the Keneally book. And that list, there were at least five. You know, it just kept changing. And he was taking bribes to get your name on the list. It's terrible. And when they were overnight at Gross Rosen, it seems like the, the list wasn't with them. And so it had to be recreated from memory in order to oh. see who was going to leave Gross Rosen and make it onto Schindler's factory. You know, and at this point, okay. there's still a negotiating going on at the last minute. Hey, come on, you put me, put my name on the list, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give you something when we, you know, get out of here or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can't show all that in the movie. So yeah, they were, they were in Auschwitz, the women, for a much longer time. And when they finally made it to the factory, it's Zwita, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. That scene with Schindler up on the platform with the men, that's how it's described with actually when the women arrive, you know, as a way to say, you're here now and everything's going to be okay. I don't know if that's dramatized in the book or not, but you did have a lot of survivors um, who were interviewed for it. So maybe some part of that was true, that he did stand up there and effectively welcome them in. And he, and especially his wife, really nursed some of these women back to health. They would not have survived if not for Emily Schindler. So... I like how they did that in the movie, you know, where he welcomed the men and then when he finally got the women back, he walked in with the Mm. women because he actually went to, I don't know if this actually happened, but in the movie, he actually went to Auschwitz to get the women back. And so he came back on the train with them. And so when they got off the train and they were walking into the camp, he was walking in with them. And I liked that because it, it showed the links that he was going to save these people. That was when I finally, finally started to like Oscar Schindler as a human being. (laughs) Because for the first two thirds of this movie, I did not like him at all. I mean, he, he had a few moments, particularly when he started understanding exactly how vile Gert was. And when he went to comfort his housekeeper, let her know, well, he's not gonna shoot you because he wants something from you. You know, he's telling her the truth, but he's also doing it to comfort her, you know? And so he started having moments where he was starting to understand exactly how terrible these people are. But it wasn't until he himself in the movie was shown to be actively involved in trying to save people that I started to like him. Because the whole first part even like you were just talking about with the cigarette case and, and the cigarettes and everything that, that Schindler's giving to Stern that Stern is then giving to the German to bribe him. The way I interpreted that was not that Schindler was giving it 
to Stern to be a bribe to someone else. It was he was giving it to Stern for whatever reason. And Stern was taking the initiative to save all these people. It had nothing to do with Schindler Mm. until we got to the point at the end when Schindler and Stern are in the room together starting to make the list. And and maybe I'm interpreting that incorrectly, but I didn't see him as trying to save anybody until that point. Everything before that was Stern. That's why he was angry with Stern for saving the man who only had one arm. But on the flip side of that, he didn't fire the man. You know, he he yelled at him and he was like, why did you do this? He's useless, blah, blah, blah. But he didn't fire him either. And so it's, it's, it's like he was taking credit for it, but not actually being proactive about it and so it wasn't until I was seeing him be proactive that I started to think he was a decent person Mm. if that makes sense it does did you see it that way Matthew in terms of it being stern uh, being the one saving people I think it definitely starts out that way I like that you see the slight incidences of him taking the the chap aside and giving him the work permit and then sending him back into the queue yes there, there is the scene in the middle that I think is, is the point where you can kind of see it changing without even Schindler realizing it's changing around him. When the Jewish girl who is presenting as though she's not Jewish, yes, uh, I can't remember mm-hmm. her name, but she comes to see him and, and is asking him to, I think, save her parents. Mm-hmm. And he, he sends her away. He is, no, I don't want part of this. There's too much risk. And he goes to Stern and, and he unloads on him almost. He's saying, no, I'm not doing this. This is not what we're here for. We're here to make money. We are businessmen. And this was, this was the opportunity. Mm-hmm. And then he ends with, but here's my watch. And, and do go and get her parents out. And, and there is just right. a, a, a gentle twist. And, and I don't think particularly even Schindler knows that he's sort of, he's in it now. This is the point it, it changes around him. Because it's, but this one request I will I will go with. But from that point on, it starts being more and more. He's, he's giving up. Uh, I, I can't remember if the cigarette cases before or after that. But yeah, you see that then moving on. And you see the lighter going on. And you see other bits going with him. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's, it's very interesting to see both of your perspectives, which I think are related. And I think I feel mm. the same way. I'm a little bit influenced by the book, which tries to mm-hmm. tell you that Schindler hated Ammon from the beginning. He puts on a great show and he knows how to use people to his advantage. And I think the way I would say I see it is that, and this is a bit influenced by the book too, I think Stern saw that Schindler maybe could be this person who could save them. And I think he was gently guiding him to be the person he could become and that he did become. Or maybe brought out the best in him that was hiding, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, mm. because that, that is sort of the progression that we get in the movie, I think, is, is Stern. I think Stern sees something in Schindler that makes him bold enough to do this, knowing that if Schindler catches him, he's not really going to get in trouble for yeah. it. Yeah. And he didn't. You know, like Matthew was just telling us about that scene. Yeah, of course, you know, he gets yelled at a lot, <laughs> but that conversation ends with another bribe and let's go save yeah. some more people. So I, I think all three of us are spot on, <laughs> just in different ways. <laughs> we agree. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's it's really interesting that the, the shades of grey to Schindler are almost the thing that allow it to happen. The fact he can grease the wheels and he can mix in that company and put on the act of dehumanising the Jewish people. Oh yeah, you spray them with water. I don't want to. I don't want to smell them. And but he is doing it in to to try and. Mm-hmm. Yes. If Stern had tried to do that, or or not not even go that far, the work that Stern tried to do, he would end up in a camp, and he almost does. Yes. As the film shows us, he almost gets taken away because of his own. He just doesn't pick up the bit of paper one morning. That's right. But because he's trying to be so good, he can't quite get to the scale that uh, Schindler can do it at. Yes. Interesting uh, side fact about the spraying of those cattle cars in the book. They tell mm-hmm. you there there were two people who survived from those cattle cars who said that they were oh. stopped along the way and buckets of water were brought in. So that's that's interesting. I mean, I think that people lived because of that alone. Mm. Yeah, and all, all the way through, he does that. He plays the, the game of the Nazis almost. I, I know game is not the right word to use, but he, even at the end, the bit of his factor in it, he says to the Nazis, you're not allowed to shoot these people. Because if you do, you'll go to prison and I'll get rich. Yeah. He's not doing it in terms of you can't shoot these people because they're people. Right. <laughs> but he, he sells it to them on a level they can understand. And it's it helps to save the lives. And it's exactly the, the right thing he needs to do to these people who are just following orders. He says in inverted commas, they're not taking any steps. They're not doing necessarily the right thing. So he's finding a way to make them do it. Yeah. Yeah. 
absolutely. And that's what's so interesting about him as a person and then in the movie as a character. He's, you know, mm. from the moment he steps on the screen, right? This this man can work a room. But he knows yeah. how to work people. <laughs> he, he can grease the wheels. He knows what to say. He knows what people like to hear. And he uses mm. it to his advantage, which ultimately is to the advantage of all of these people. Yeah, and, and just the, the presence that Liam Neeson brings. He is a, a proper presence in a room. There was the comment earlier of the, the small and furtive people around him. He is six foot three. Yeah. <laughs> and he, and... Yeah. <laughs> You know, he was a young man at this point. He was built very well. So, yeah, he, he dominates the room around him. Yes, absolutely. And actually, that that brings us into one of my, my favourite things about the film in general is it never tells us what's going on. No, not what's going on. The motivations behind things all the way through. And, and this is why we've got uh, slight variations on the way we've interpreted it and when, when we think things happen, because it's showing us every stage that it is step by step by step that he ends up wanting to save all these people and and it starts off with him being opportunistic you know, as it starts and as he sees it people are being moved out of their homes and, and they're being restricted in what they can and can't do and he understands a way to make some money from that right when it gets to this severe point when it is the cowardice of okay we're being beaten in the war so we now need to inter and burn all the bodies and he, he starts seeing the massacres going on around him. Then then it changes, and then you start seeing that he wants to do everything he can, but doesn't start off with that. It is, and, and the film takes us on the journey to the point where, by the end, he is having that emotional breakdown. He's realising there was even more that he could have done if he hadn't been himself, if he hadn't been trying to make money and trying to raise a factory to, to earn a fortune. But we don't get a moment in the middle of him moralising and giving speeches that uh, a, a, another film, another director might have done. Yeah, that would not have worked. <laughs> Preachy is never going to work, yeah. Absolutely, yes. Judy, what were the, the elements of the film that you... Uh, you know, what were your favourite moments or favourite performances or elements to it? Again, favor. I don't know the right. It's not. Yeah, I know. Uh, in in quotation marks, inverted commas yeah. for the Brits who are listening. <laughs> um. <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> How to choose for me? So many things. What I really thought was excellent was so so many juxtapositions throughout the film. Mm. From the beginning, you have the couple, the the wealthy couple, the wealthy Jewish couple, mm. being forced out of their home and into the ghetto and then in the next shot Oscar they say you know he says oh my god this is terrible and then Oscar the next shot is Oscar moves into the house uh, this will be perfect you know um, yeah. wh- whatever the lines were they they you know they mirrored each other they were opposites the lists certainly throughout the film in the beginning Right? They set up these folding chairs and these folding tables. It's all very organized. Here's the list of the Jews that are going to be moved to the ghetto. And then you've got you've got the list sort of throughout, but then the ultimate juxtaposition is, of course, Schindler's list. Hmm. You know, that that list, as as Stern says, the list is life. And all the other lists then are what? Death, potentially. Yeah. Similarly, that shot of Amon having his semi-annual physical, and God, he gained a lot of weight for this film mm. to he match the, the, the real character. You show that, and you know, right below him, down in the factory, or the barracks, whatever, you've got the, the selection for transport, selection of the unfit. And they're running around and, and there were so many like that. These are just a few. And, and I think also the scenes we already talked about where Schindler says, is saying to Stern, he's, he's telling him who to get from the factory, hands him the watch, hands him the cigarette case. And the next shot is Goldberg wearing the watch, flicking the lighter, mm-hmm. opening the cigarette case. I, I think that's just some, some brilliant work by Spielberg doing that. And then, of course... Overall, the cinematography is outstanding. Uh, hence, it won an Oscar. Yes. The light and shadow, the girl in the red dress, of course, we already talked about. There's that scene at the toward the end when Schindler is trying to get the women out of Auschwitz. And the man, the high-level man that he's talking to, the high-level Nazi, I don't know if you notice, he's, he's in shadow. The top half of his whole face is in shadow. I mean, cinematography is not at all my area, but I feel like something is certainly being said by having him in shadow. He's, he's you know, the bad guy, essentially. Yeah. So those, those sorts of things, I, I would also say the music, 
John Williams, the best. He won best original song for this. The violin music, while Schindler is, uh, I'd say, quote unquote, interviewing the secretaries early on when he's opening the factory and then he hires them all. It's classic. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it's like a dance, the way he, they have that music and these ladies are typing, you know, and then you've got the one who's mm. not good looking <laughs> and he's just bored. They're typing really expertly. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's brilliant. And every beat, he's moving closer and closer to them. Absolutely. I, I just love it. I mean, he, you know, so well done. this yeah. is a man who loves women. And <laughs> then the, that piano music, the Bach music, which the soldier said was was mozart that they're playing when they come mm. back after they've after they've liquidated the ghetto at night just the way that was done the guy steps out onto the piano keys and then the the soldier is playing and then then it's this whole piece in the background is all this this franticness is happening so it's just like i say the whole thing comes together and that's mm. that's what makes it so um, incredible of a production and ben kingsley is it's yeah. stern brilliant i mean they're all brilliant yeah. but uh, yeah love him and, and that is how he's described yeah. in the book just like that sort of a, a bookish type okay yeah you're absolutely right the direction the director of photography the music for it the performances there isn't anything in this that you would say oh that that could have been stronger it's all so good yeah, yeah. and we're gushing yeah. but it is so good sometimes you have to <laughs> say it is yeah yeah i know in in previous episodes matthew and i have talked about before how I really respond to emotional value of something mm. generally more than intellectual value and I think this movie has both but the parts that speak to me the most are the ones that affected me the most emotionally and those are two of the parts that are the hardest to watch I mean a lot of this movie was really really hard to watch let me just say that but the scene at the end when the war is over and Oscar is getting ready to leave and and I know we talked about the scene already when he's going over and he just he breaks down because he's realizing that if he hadn't clung so much to his material possessions he could have saved even more people mm. and that's the first time that i really felt like we got real true honest emotion from schindler in this movie and it's the piece that i'm gonna remember the most about oscar schindler in this movie because of that and then i hesitate to say this just because it's mm. the favorite section but you, you guys know what I mean. It, it's it's impactful for me. Mm -hmm. It's it's the part that really, really affected me, and that was the, the liquidation of the ghetto part. Mm -hmm. um, particularly, Julie, you were talking about the music at the end and then how frantic it got, and that was the section where they were going through all of the buildings and finding all of the children who were still mm -hmm. hiding. And they were they were using machine guns on all of these children. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the little boy who was taped to the bottom of the bed and the ones who were under the floor and in and, and the cabinets and climbing out of the ceiling. And it was all children who was left behind. And, and this is the moment, you know, this is right after we've seen the little girl in the red dress walking through. And you expect for her to be one of the the victims that we see killed on screen and and we don't thankfully though we do later find out that she mm. was a victim we don't see that but we see all of these other children killed and the cinematography was masterful because we don't actually see any of these children killed right mm -hmm. thank god but we see what they're doing the callousness and the emotional like the, the lack of emotion in fact they're they're almost gleeful to be doing it and this is the scene where I completely broke down. I had to stop the movie for like a solid 15 or 20 minutes and compose myself before I could turn it back on. And it's not a scene that I'm ever going to forget. And because of that, I feel like it needs to be mentioned because it was done so well with a combination of how it was shot and, and the music and how they managed to make me feel the way that they wanted to make me feel. And so, yeah, I just, I just need to talk about that for a minute. So. God, it makes me want to cry. Yeah, the the film all the way through is incredibly affecting. The the piece for me, I think Julie, you mentioned it earlier, is the children being marched onto and sent away in the trucks, mm. and the children are, are laughing and waving because they can see their mums and so on. And I, I will always respond to mothers and sons very strongly. Yeah. Um, and and that was you know that is genuinely horror uh, possibly even more so than the, the shower sequence a bit later on because it's just that the women know what's happening yeah and they can't do right. anything and it's just so so bleak <sighs> yeah well and then they but, show the the children who didn't get on the trucks trying to find a place to hide mm, oh yeah and it, it 
and my even heart. children not not giving room to the others because they want to do anything they can. And and, and we saw the the boy who's working with the police earlier. Yes. Because yes, if he works with the police, he will not be beaten or sent away from his family. So right. <laughs> yes, and he did in the book. He saved Mrs. Dresner is her name, mm. um, and I I think that she was there maybe in the interviews or something. So. He saves her. Uh, how many others couldn't be? How do you choose? Mm. L- like the list. Uh, you know, yeah. you have all these people who are on the list, and, and how about the ones who didn't get on the list? The, the sequence that really resonates, that, that I've come away from it, that has just stayed on my mind uh, since watching it, I actually went back and watched again, is, is that very end sequence building up to the credits with the actors and the people they portrayed visiting Schindler's grave mm. and leaving the rock. Um, first of all, that's that's an incredible way to show it, that it, yes, people did survive, and they are still alive today. And, and for, for a while, I didn't get that it was them with the actors. I thought, oh, they've just got young family with them, taking them through. Ah. And then suddenly you get, you get Mrs. Stern, and I'm like, her husband looks really like Ben Kingsley. <laughs> And it suddenly clicked. I'm like, oh my word, this is what this is. So I had to go back and watch it again because it's so powerful to have shown that in that way. But then you get the, the text on screen. 4,000 Jews left in, in Poland, but there are 6,000 descendants from the, um, the, the Schindler Juden. Yeah. And it's, it's the, the thing that it's not countries who, who will make history or make these changes. It's the people and the actions of the people to, and what they did. Mm, that's that's it, absolutely right. That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. To close out the film doing that, and, and then the, the very last shot is Liam Neeson standing over the grave. Yes. That's, that's, oh, it's a great way to show it. It's, it's such a masterstroke. That part always makes me cry again. You know, you, you're crying mm. and then you kind of compose yourself and then you go along and then something else happens. But this scene at the end, anytime that music, that theme music that John Williams has for this, anytime mm-hmm. that starts playing i can feel the tears behind my eyes but this this scene of them all coming down these real people you know Mm. more than one of them either you put their hand on the grave rubbed it kissed their hand i mean they have their lives and generations to to show Mm. uh, you know they thank him for this yeah and that is that is his grave in uh, on mount zion he is the only member of the nazi party buried in jerusalem Mm. julie just a a side note, almost, is the leaving of the stone? Is that a ritual thing? Is there some? Is that a yes normal thing? Um, Jews don't put flower, don't bring flowers to funerals. We don't put flowers on graves. Okay. I actually meant to research this to confirm that what I know is is accurate. But my understanding is this: okay. flowers are used at Christian funerals originally to cover the smell. You know, back in the day, right? Hundreds of years ago. But yeah. in, in under Jewish law, uh, you have to be yep. buried within 48 hours, 24, 48 hours, I believe. 24 hours? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. So so flowers were never used. And so, I, I yes, I find that so powerful as they each lay one one down mm. for that scene at the end. And you just see the, the queue behind them to come down. Yes. I mean, they, yeah, they only terrific. give you the names of the ones who are highlighted in the movie. But yes. it's to see them come over the hill like that, it's really powerful. Mm. So within the Jewish faith, it is customary to leave a small stone on the grave as a sign to others that someone has visited the grave. So huh. it, allows, it allows people to be part of this tradition of commemorating the burial and remembering the deceased. And I did read somewhere that the stones are a fitting symbol of the lasting presence of the deceased memory and their life. So it's, you know, it's it's kind of a beautiful little symbol there as well. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I like that. A man is not dead while his name is still spoken. Oh, right. That's, that's what that reminds me of. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting some very American Gods vibes right now because that's what I've been immersed in, you know, for the last couple of days, <laughs> okay. you know, I've been listening to the audiobook and cause you know, the, the show just started last week. And so part of the premise of, of that book is that, you know, the gods live while people still remember them. Mm. Ah, that's yes, right. And, and so it's, it's very much a similar, similar vibe there, I think. Yeah. Mm. I, I need to do a lot more reading. Of, um, the, the quote I just did is Terry Pratchett. Okay. Terry Pratchett wrote a book with Neil Gaiman. Good Omens, and Neil Gaiman wrote American Gods. One of the sort of central things for the Discworld is that gods get more powerful as more people believe in them. But it's actual legitimate power. They get they get bigger. They they can do more things. So he has whole books about someone who only has one 
uh, I think it might be small gods. There's someone who only has one believer, and he is basically a small turtle. Aww. He, then, Aww. he then has to get this person to get more believers for him. And... <laughs> but okay. but I don't I don't know which came first because it's for me it's such a Terry Pratchett idea. I don't know if Neil Gaiman sort of half inched it for American Gods or it went the other way. Or maybe it's out there, you know, from something a long time ago. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But they, everything's they, connected. So yes. they, they were very, very good friends. So uh, probably they just yeah. developed it together. Anyway, that was tangential. Yes, it was. <laughs> and, you know, before we completely go off the rails here, is there anything else that you guys think we need to discuss about Schindler's List? I would just point out one thing that was talked about in the book, which I thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Schindler was a bit of a spy, (laughs) as it turns out. Yes. He was, yes. Yeah, so, okay, you've seen this. So I guess there was this, there's this organization, this is a Zionist organization, as they called it um, at the time and and probably still now, um, that was trying to find out what was happening in Europe at this time and they came and I guess I think it's a little unclear in the book they think whether it was through Stern or somebody else somebody gave them Schindler's name and he met with them he even traveled to Budapest Hungary to meet with higher up people because basically the perception was that nobody would believe this story it was Mm. too outlandish there's no way that this was going on in real life so he they said we'd like you to come in person and tell them and he did and the information that he gave I don't know that it made a difference in the war or saving anybody but it certainly was added to the record of the evidence of of what what had happened and and I think there's a fair amount of it at Yad Vashem which is the Holocaust memorial in um in Israel so that was interesting and then we you know we talked about the role of Emily Schindler which is not really shown so much in the movie yeah there's there's a lot more about his him not necessarily philandering but being a ladies man yes (laughs) it is actually about the women that he was with yeah, all of which is true, mm, yes. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I guess the only other thing I would say is that if anybody who's listening is interested in seeing other approaches to telling the many varied stories of the Holocaust, I would recommend, obviously, Anne Frank, the book. Um, mm-hmm. I know there have been at least one, if not multiple adaptations, movie adaptations as a play. I, I may have seen one a long time ago, but I can't, I can't remember, so I can't comment on it but obviously the book Night by Elie Wiesel, of course, Mm -hmm. is, you know, one of the most highly regarded tellings of a a Holocaust story. And Elie Wiesel was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in, his work for for peace and for um, other populations that were suffering the same things that happened during the Holocaust, other genocides. And then finally, as a movie that probably a lot of people have not heard of, Escape from Sobibor is really interesting. It Mm. is the telling of the true story of the escape of these Jews from a large number of them from the Sobibor concentration camp. Obviously, it's going to be another difficult movie to watch with everything that leads up to the escape, but really interesting to see. And that, of course, is that perspective that you don't see in this movie, which is them fighting back. Mm. Yeah, I I can't recall seeing much of that perspective in the things that I've read or, or seen, just because usually the point of time that's being told in the stories that I'm familiar with are late enough that the prisoners are just so defeated and they know that if they fight back, they're going to die. And so I would actually be really interested in seeing that. Yeah, that that is really interesting. And then a similar, I don't know that there is any, I'm not aware of a telling. There probably is one. Um, I'm certainly there's books. I'm not aware of a movie um, about the Warsaw ghetto uprising, um, in mm-hmm. 1943, the Jewish resistance just, they, they fought back for, I don't remember how long it was, but they were armed. They, you know, they were vastly outnumbered and the Nazis had to bring in more and more soldiers. Ultimately, obviously, the the ghetto was liquidated, but that fight is really something as a story to, to be aware of, you know? Hmm. Well, I will certainly, you know, look for that, look for more information on that and 
and look for the Escape from Sobibor movie. I'm not even sure that I've ever even heard the name Sobibor before. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, I definitely want to look at that. I will say it has been a very long time since I've seen it. It was probably high school when I saw it, and I think it was old then. It may have been 70s or 80s movie. Um, so I can't comment on how well it was done from a film critic perspective. Good enough that the story really stuck with me, though. So mm. Right. Well, I don't think it's something that we would want to put on the list, for sure. No. Um, I, don't I, I feel is. like at this point, one Holocaust movie is enough. <laughs> yes. Agreed. So with that in mind, do you actually have any recommendations that we might add to the list? Well, I do, because despite the heavy subject matter today, on a lighter note, I'm a huge fan of classic 80s movies and some 90s as well, and I see that you've got most of them on your list, but I will throw a few out to see if you've seen them or uh, if I missed them somehow on the list. But have you seen E.T.? The very first memory I have of seeing a movie in the theater is E.T. Oh, okay. I love that movie. Spielberg again. And that one's, you know, that one's sad. So we got to go lighter. But, um, and I don't know how much lighter this is, but have you seen The Karate Kid? <laughs> I have seen The Karate Kid, though it, honestly, it, it may fit the same criteria that we used for Ghostbusters. I'll have to give that some thought. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I'm very, very familiar, of course, with Mr. Miyagi and Wax On, Wax Off. <laughs> yes, classic. But I couldn't tell you the main character's name to save my life. Wow. Okay. Yeah, no idea. I know that he does karate. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a bully. And he's a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll have to give that one some thought. It it may qualify. Okay, all right. We could watch the uh, Jaden Smith remake of it. Oh, no. No, <laughs> no. no I, I'm firmly against pretty much almost any remake, So especially okay. of classic movies like this. Well, I it's your show. So. You can do what you want, but uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be sending you scathing comments if you do. So, <laughs> Okay, but one of my all-time favorite movies when I was in, like, middle high school was The Next Karate Kid, starring Hilary Swank. I Ooh. loved that movie. So, you know, I've I think I've seen that. Oh, maybe, maybe so it was like a bit. <laughs> yeah, I think it was her first big movie. Still has Mr. Miyagi in it, but this time it's a girl who's kicking butt. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. I loved it. Loved it. So if you guys haven't seen that one, you should. That's right. And anyway, yeah. it's Hillary Swank, so you can't say no to that. No. It's teenage Hillary Swank, which is awesome. Still, yeah, right. <laughs> I noticed you you have some 90s movies, so it's okay to expand to the 90s? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Have you seen Reality Bites or Singles? No. Okay. I think I think absolutely one or both of these should go on your list. I feel they are classic to the time period. I don't even think I've heard of Singles. Oh, my God. Yeah, you have to see Singles. I mean, Matthew, <laughs> are you with me on this? I don't know. Have you seen them? Yes. Singles, I know. I, I feel like I've seen it, but it's another one that I just remember always being in, like, bargain basement video and DVD sales. Oh, well, I think okay. they were really great at the time. And then I think, you know, they're representative of sort of the whole pop culture at the time, including music, etc. The Seattle thing, you know, plaid. <laughs> that's, de <laughs> that's definitely my thing. Okay. <laughs> Give me a flannel shirt and some floppy hair and I'm there. <laughs> Excellent. Exactly. Um... <laughs> okay. We'd like to see a picture of that. <laughs> um, the only other ones I would throw out there just randomly, which you've probably seen, Jerry Maguire, Edward Scissorhands, Beetlejuice, you know, classic. Yes. Yes to all yes. three. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, I would have liked to have sat here talking about Jerry Maguire. Oh, God. Very few romantic comedies I own. If you did that movie, I, you'd have to bring me back because I adore that movie. Julie. <laughs> yes. You complete me. <laughs> you had me at hello. <laughs> I was going to go with that one, but we didn't actually say hello, so oh. it, it didn't work. But yeah. No, I love that movie. And um, for me, Jonathan Lipnicki is always going to be the adorable eight-year-old, five-year-old, however yeah. old he is. He did not grow up. He stayed that age. Did you know the human head weighs eight pounds? Oh my god, I love that. <laughs> so many lines. Uh, yeah. So yes, I, I have seen that one. It's great. 
Okay. Well, that's okay. good, but I'm disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Before this becomes the Jerry Maguire <laughs> quote, yeah. Part quote two. podcast, yeah, um, I'm going to move us into some listener feedback. Okay. So we've had a few nice comments over the last week or so. JLMO, Jan M on Twitter, said that she really enjoyed what catching up on PC Deprived with Mandy Kay. She rewatched Godfather this week and remembered how amazingly good it is. It I, is an amazingly good movie. I, I think we quite enjoyed that one, yes. Yes. <laughs> I enjoyed that podcast as well, having not seen the movie in a long time. It was all coming back to me, and I was loving it, yeah. We're really pleased someone enjoyed the Godfather episode, and I think we're going to be scheduling the sequel uh, for an upcoming show in the next few months. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward to seeing Michael's story progress, so that mm-hmm. will definitely be coming up. And frequent commenter Holly, at HollyMVG on Twitter, uh, had a response to Monty Python. You guys, we got so many responses to the Monty Python episode. It's fantastic. And Holly said she just finished the Holy Grail episode of PC Deprived, and she laughed the entire time. Matthew, your love for the film was so fun to hear. <laughs> and I agree. Yeah, we've just, we just stopped this being the, uh, the Jerry Maguire quote fest. But that was basically me quoting Monty Python, which I'll do any time. Anyone wants it, more than happy to. Yeah, I laughed the entire time during that podcast, too. It was awesome. But I am so with you, Mandy. I could not stand <laughs> that movie. <laughs> yes, I am validated. Yeah, but it was, it was great to hear, you know, Matthew, you were just so into it. And I was like, that's so great. That's great yeah. for you. Love I just can't love. And it's. I love hearing people love what they love. So even if I don't love it, it's great when you do. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Well, if you want to get in touch and give us your comments on this or any other movie we've discussed, you can use the hashtag PC Deprived on Twitter. You can also email us using podcast at eloquentgushing.com, or you can comment on this post on eloquentgushing.com. You can find each of us on Twitter. I'm at Mandy Kay. And I'm at Matthew Bose. And you can also find me on Twitter. I'm at Book of Jewels, spelled J-U-L-E-S. Please remember to go and subscribe on iTunes or your podcast app of choice. Um, and if you can, leave us a rating and a review. We'd love to hear what you think. And uh, Feel free to send us some feedback and let us know when you comment. And we'll be back next week with another episode of Pop Culturally Deprived, where we'll talk about The Graduate with our friend Anya, a.k.a. Strangely Literal, from the Shadows and Shamblers podcast about the Star's original series, American Gods. Until next time, I'm Mandy Kay. And whoever saves one life, saves the world entire. Pop Culturally Deprived is an Eloquent Gushing production. For more information, visit eloquentgushing.com or find us on Twitter at Eloquent Gushing.